Today, we're going to talk about memory and how your use of memory can impact the speed, the performance of your programs in C, C++, pretty much any language out there. Hey, welcome back, everybody. Today, I want to talk about performance, specifically making your programs run faster. And specifically, I wanted to talk about memory and how memory and your use of memory can impact performance. Because most programmers don't typically think about this. They don't typically think about how memory access times can actually impact your program performance. We just think about the steps, the actions, the instructions that our programs are going to take. And we get a rough idea maybe of how those work. And maybe we think about algorithmic complexity of our different algorithms. But we don't usually think about memory access. But that stops today because today we're going to dig into this topic just a little bit. But before we do, a big thanks to all of you patrons that support this channel on Patreon, people like Jorge Vieira, Abby Peyton Jones, and Dave McDonald, who help me keep the lights on and the cameras rolling. If you're new to the channel, Patreon is also how you can get access to all the source code from all my videos, as well as access to my virtual office hours. And that may be relevant because we are going to be making source code today. So now with that said, let's get back to memory. So when you saw the title, when you heard me introduce this, most people, when they think about memory impacting program performance, you think about my program is using too much memory and that too much memory usage is impacting how it performs and maybe impacting other programs as well. And this can happen. Maybe we'll talk about that in a future video. But today I want to specifically just talk about how we access memory or the patterns with which we access memory and how that can impact performance in ways that maybe you haven't thought about. So let's look at what I'm talking about in an example. So this is a really simple program. We're going to start out here. Now, for this example, I'm going to need a substantial amount of memory, you know, something fairly big. It'll work with smaller amounts of memory too, but the results won't be quite as dramatic. So let's come up here first and let's make a couple of sizes. We're, what we're going to do is we're going to make a two-dimensional array. Um, we'll just call it 2D array. We talked about matrices and two-dimensional arrays in a previous video. Check that out if you haven't seen that or if any of this confuses you. But we're going to have a certain number of rows and a certain number of columns. And let's just define that up here, rows. Let's say we've got 100,000 rows. And let's say, struggle with writing define today. Um, number of columns, let's make 10,000. Okay, so if I'm doing my math correct, uh, 100,000 rows, 10,000 columns, that's gonna be what, about four gigabytes of memory. Okay, so that's a pretty big data structure. Notice that I made it global. I didn't put it on the stack because I can guarantee you the default stack size on my machine is not four gigs. So if I had made it local, I would basically be getting a seg fault when I run it. So now down in main, let's actually put something in here. So what I'm gonna do is just, I'm gonna go through all the rows and columns and let's just say, okay, so rows. And then let's also go through in j equals zero, j is less than calls. Okay, so we're gonna go through each row and column, basically go through each individual entry in this 2D array. And then what we're gonna do is set each of those to some random number. Okay, I know rand isn't the best random number generator out there, but it doesn't really matter for the example that we're looking at. So I'm just gonna go with it. And note that I'm only doing this because I need my program to actually be doing something. Otherwise the compiler might try to get smart and start optimizing things out. And that would defeat the purpose of trying to measure how long things are taking. Okay, so now we've got all these random numbers. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to declare a in 64 t a sum variable will start out as zero. And then I'm basically gonna do the same thing I did up here. Just gonna copy and paste it down here. And instead what we're gonna do is we're going to just sum these up. So we're gonna say sum plus equals 2D array and we'll just remove the rand. Okay, so what I'm doing basically is I've generated four gigabytes worth of random numbers and then I'm gonna go through and just sum them all up. Okay, and then down here at the bottom, then we'll just print it out. We'll say sum equals LLD, the two L's are because this is a long, long, this is a very big number. And then we're done. Okay, so simple program example. I just, this is basically what I wanna play with. Okay, and I've called this program by row.c because I'm basically going through the array by rows first and then by columns. So we're going row by row and then hitting, you know, so we go down each row and then hit all the columns in that row and then we go to the next row. Now let's look, I wanna look at the alternative to this. So if we just copy this whole thing, I also have a file over here called by call. And then what I'm gonna do is just, we're gonna switch this up a little bit. And instead of going by rows, we're gonna go by columns first. And otherwise everything is gonna stay the same. Okay, so the summation, it's gonna get the same result. We're summing up the same random numbers. We're just changing the order by which we actually go. 
And so instead of going row by row, we're going columns first and then rows. So no big deal. We're still doing exactly the same thing, more or less. We should still get the same result. We'll make sure we run it to make sure. But now let's take a look at what happens when we actually run them. So again, as usual, I have a make file, simple make file, nothing fancy here, except there is one thing that's a little different. So I did make this timing target right here. And all that's going to do is it's going to run these two programs that I'm going to build. And then we're just going to we're going to use the time command to basically determine how long they take to run rather than just saying, uh, you know, trying to ballpark it or use a stopwatch. OK, so let's come down here, make sure everything compiles. OK, it looks like it does. No problem. And then let's run it with this timing command and let's just see it's going to take a little while and we'll wait for the first one to finish. It's going to finish hopefully pretty soon. OK, so it finished, took a few seconds. Not too bad. You know, that's actually pretty fast for going through four gigabytes worth of integers. And then the second one, we're kind of waiting for it. It seems like it's taking a little bit longer than the first one, but we'll see when it happens to finish. Come on, buddy, you can do it. Um, OK, anytime now. Uh, OK, so it did finish and it did take longer. It took more than twice as long. So what's going on? Well, it really comes down to how we are accessing memory. So not all memory accesses are created equal. And you may or may not know this, especially if you're a beginner, but your computer actually has a lot of different kinds of memory in it. It has registers, which are a few fast and expensive, all the way to disk or your solid state hard drive, which is big and slow, has tons of memory, but it takes a long time to access. And so when I access this big four gigabyte array, each element in the array could be stored in cache, in which case it's going to be really fast, or it could maybe not be in cache, but in RAM, which is going to be slower, but maybe it's OK. It is going to be slower, though. And then maybe in some extreme cases, some of that memory may have been pushed out, swapped out to disk, as we say. And then in that case, it's going to be really slow to bring in and access. And the point is, is that over here, when I go through row by row, what I'm doing is I'm accessing items in memory that are close to each other. So these items are likely to fit into the same cache line, meaning that if the first element on the line wasn't in the cache, well, so that one was a little slow, but then the next few are going to be in cache and that's going to be really, really fast. On the other hand, when we go column by column, every element we access is going to be far away from the previous one. So the chance that any of our accesses are going to be loaded in the cache at any given time is actually really low. And so our memory accesses are going to be slower, significantly slower. Now, this concept is called locality. We talk about programs with good spatial locality, meaning that they tend to access memory that is close to each other. So each individual access tends to access areas in memory that are close to the previous accesses. There's also temporal locality, which deals with like accessing the same pieces of memory close together in time. So there's there's close together in space and that's close together in time. But both are basically just looking at how we access things in a way that tries to encourage elements in memory to be in cache, to be in faster memory, so we get higher performance. Now, naturally, there are going to be times where you just don't care, and you have to access memory in a random way. It just makes the most sense for your program, and that's cool. Just know that if it's a lot of memory, things are going to be a bit slow. And there's nothing wrong with that. Locality is just one factor to consider as a programmer. And my point wasn't to tell you you always need to access things in a certain way, but rather to just point this out so that you can keep it in mind as you're developing systems, especially systems that have performance constraints that have to run really fast to make your programs run better if you do have control over the pattern with which you go through these arrays. Because even if you think I'm doing the exact same thing, it can have an impact on how well things run. Now I can hear some of you saying, what about compiler optimization? And I'm hearing others of you out there saying, well, why? what about C++ if you just use Valeray or Vector like any other respectable C++ programmer? All of your problems would go away. And of course, that's not true. That wouldn't solve all these issues. Issues, and I do plan to address both of these issues in a video shortly. But today, this is all the time I have. So I hope it's helpful. We'll address both those topics in a future video very soon. Subscribe to the channel if you don't want to miss those videos. Like the video if you liked it and want to let the world know more about it. Of course, share it with your friends. Support the channel on Patreon if you are so inclined. And of course, check out my courses if you want to spend a little more time together. And I will see you next week.